looked at grace from Ephesians chapters 1 through 3. And we're going to look at grace once again as a type of part 2, as it is. And any time we speak about God's grace, we always need to remind ourselves that, yes, we must obey. There in the scripture reading, when Paul says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. That walking worthy of the calling, that's talking about obedience. So certainly, in, in the context of God's grace, it is not as though God's grace is meant to substitute for our obedience. It's not meant to do that. We are called to obey, but we must always remember that we are saved by grace. That that is how we are saved. We are saved by God's favor. The scripture, re the scripture reading ended there in verse 6 of Ephesians 4. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. What we spoke about last week was that as God is the source, right? He's the architect. Everything is from Him. Before we ever loved Him, He loved us. Now, all right, so it, it comes from Him. That's, that's where it comes from. He has revealed the mystery we spoke about in chapters 1 through 3. We also spoke about how His power works in us. And I think that's the one that we really need to understand. His power works in us. We are instruments of righteousness. That's why He gets the glory. That's why Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, that we were nothing, that God gives the increase. All glory goes to Him. He is glorified. So in that sense, as we think about the, the ultimate goal of glorifying God through His Son. Sometimes, and I, I made the point, I believe, this morning in class, we speak about the grace of God as though grace is another person in the Godhead. Right? We'll, we'll say, well, we're saved by grace, and we are saved by grace. Ephesians 2 says that. For by grace, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. But sometimes we speak about grace almost personifying it. And we again, we touched on that a little bit in class, that there are verses that, that speak, I would suggest, about Jesus and speak about grace. Um, but here as we think about it, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We are not saved by the gift. We are saved by God. <laughs> we, are that, we are saved by God. We are saved by Jesus. He is our Savior. And, and the point that I'm wanting to make is that as He is our Savior, there is absolutely nothing that we can do to earn our salvation or to force our salvation. There's nothing we can do to force our way into heaven. There's nothing we can do to earn our way into heaven. It has to be granted by God's favor. It must be granted by God's grace. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that we can do to earn it. We cannot earn our salvation. We are saved by grace through faith and that not of, our, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I'm not saying that we should not walk in them. We should walk in them. We are called to have a walk worthy of our calling. But we are not saved by works. Right? That's not how we're saved. We're saved by grace. As we walk, as we obey, I want to consider three, three ideas, if you will, and my hope is with this lesson that these three ideas will help us to better understand and appreciate God's grace when it when it comes right down to it. Because sometimes it's sometimes we do turn Christianity into a checklist. And I don't know how you are with checklists, but you know, you make a checklist for yourself. And for example, I have I have my routine every week. Okay, Tuesday I do one thing, Wednesday I do another thing, Thursday I, Thursday I do another thing, Friday I do another thing, Sunday, here I am, lo and behold. <laughs> it's very easy for me to say, oh, Friday, I'm done with my work, that means I don't have to do any more of the Lord's work. Check, 
Uh, see, and that's, that's just how we are with checklists. We're like, okay, I got 10 things I got to do. As soon as I get them all checked off, I'm free to do whatever else. And we turn Christianity into that. Check, 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 check. Now, we'll see at the end of the lesson, there are things that we must do. But we'll, as we think about our life, walking the walk with which we have been called, it starts moving beyond a checklist. We'll talk about that when we get to it. So we're going to look at three ideas. I'm hoping we'll better understand God's grace and perhaps even more importantly, appreciate God's grace. The first idea is we are not saved based on how much we have done. I want you to come back to Matthew. Matthew 25, and it's the parable of the talents. We're familiar with the parable of the talents. If you're not, it's throughout Matthew 25 from verse 14 down through verse 30. For time's sake, we're not going to read the whole thing. If you're not familiar with it, I would encourage you to read it. But in Matthew chapter 25 at verse 14, we read, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And no and to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the man comes back calls for everything to be calls for there to be an accounting and the one talent man says I knew you to be a hard man verse 24 reaping where you have not sown gathering where you have not scattered seed I was afraid and I went and I hid your talent in the ground look there you have what is yours verse 26 the Lord said you wicked and lazy servant you know that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and am I coming I would have received back my own with interest at the very least, therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Okay. The man was condemned for being wicked and lazy. Must we work? Yes. James speaks about faith and works, that this is how a man is justified. But even within the realm of justification, we recognize that God is just and the justifier. What it's speaking about is the idea that God is taking these things into account, that we have faith. And we obey, we work, and that God is taking these things into our account as, as we are justified. He is the justifier. Here in this account, you have three individuals, and they're given different amounts based on their ability. One man gained five talents. The second man gained two talents, and the third man gained zero talents. So which of the three had done the most? Which of the three had done the most? Well, that's an easy answer. The five-talent man, he had done the most. He had gained five talents. Was the, five ta was the Lord more pleased with the five-talent man than the two-talent man? No. <laughs> no. He's pleased with both of them. Why? Because they did what they could. They used their ability, and those talents were allotted based on their abilities. So in that sense, it helps us to understand, we are not saved based on how much we have done. A five-talent man, what does the Lord expect him to do? Five talents were the work. The two-talent man, what does the Lord expect him to do? Two talents were the work. You do the best you can with your abilities, with what you have. The woman who comes and anoints the Lord, Jesus says she has done what she could. she done what she could. Think about the, the idea of two people may do the exact same amount of work. Now this is where it starts getting huh, kind of interesting. Two people may do the exact same amount of work and the Lord may be pleased with one and not pleased with the other one. Person A does X amount of work. Person B does X amount of work. They do the same amount of work. But if person A has 10 times the ability than person B, then you see something wrong. God wants the person with more ability to do more. So even though you have these two individuals doing the same amount of work, 
God may be pleased with one and not pleased with the other. Where you see that, where you actually saw this in action was with the widow and her two mites. Right? He saw all the people giving out of their prosperity. And then he saw the, the widow and she gave two mites. And the Lord says she's actually given more than all of them. Well, how's that? It wasn't monetarily. She had not monetarily given more than anybody else. It was because she had given all based on her ability and her faith. Everyone else was giving the Lord the leftovers. That's what they were doing. They may have been giving more monetarily, but they were giving the leftovers. But this woman was giving all. And so we are not saved based on, in that account, we are not saved based on how much we give. See, this principle, we're not saved based on how much we've done. The Lord wants us to do what we can, where we are, with what we have. That's what the Lord wants. That's what the Lord wants. The amount, the amount that we do is not the critical factor. If the one talent man would have simply given it to the bankers, the Lord said, well, at least I would have gotten it back. And it would have been something. Right? The Lord understood you only have one talent. The man could have said, look, what did you expect? I only, got, I only have a little ability. Right? The talents were given based on ability. The man could have used that as a cop-out and said, I don't have much ability. And the Lord would have said, I know you don't have much ability, but you have some ability. That was the problem. But what it helps us to see is that we are not saved based on how much we do. There may be people who do more than us that are not saved, there may be people who do less than us that are saved. We're not the standard. We're not the standard. We do what we can, and we are saved by grace. That's the point. We're saved by grace. We're not saved based on how much we've done. Now, how liberating is that? Right? We have the checklist and we think we got to do this, 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 this. And there are things we must do. Again, we'll talk about it. We're talking about the plan of salvation. There are things we must do. But within the plan of salvation, the plan of salvation does not end with baptism. The plan of salvation, that very last one, living faithfully until death, that's where it starts getting into this conversation as we think about it. What does that mean to live faithfully until death? Are there still, are there still you know, as we think about, we, we, we are created for good works that we should walk in them. So do I need to see a checklist? And we need to understand that we're saved by grace. We're not saved based on how much we've done. It's not, we don't earn it. We just simply don't earn it. We are not saved based on how long we have worked. Come back a little bit to Matthew 20. Come back to Matthew chapter 20. And actually, before we read this, let me, let me add on a point to the, to the previous point. We are not saved based on how much we have done. You know, in Ephesians, there after the scripture reading, in Ephesians chapter 4, it starts speaking about the gifts of the Spirit. All right? And the Lord gave the gifts of the Spirit. That's what he gave. Um, no one in this room has ever had those gifts, right? No one in this room has ever spoken in tongues. No one in this room has ever had the gift of interpretation. No one in this room has ever had the gift of healing. No one in this room is an apostle or a prophet. Those things spoken about in 1 Corinthians 12. Those things were meant for the first century. Those things were meant to help the first century church as the church was in its infancy. But to say, to understand within our point. So does that mean because we, because I have never spoken in tongues, does that mean someone who did speak in tongues back in the first century, does that mean that they are more saved than we are? Because they had the gifts of the Spirit. 
They had the gifts of healing. They had the gifts of interpretation. They had the gifts of tongues. They had all of those gifts. So does that mean that they're more saved because they did all those things? They did all those things. Are they more saved than us because we don't have them? No. You know how? Because of grace. <laughs> because we're saved by grace. We're not saved based on how much we have done. We're just simply not. Think about the apostles. Which one of the apostles did the most? Let's rephrase the question. Which one of the apostles wrote more of the Bible? That's Paul. You, you know, in the back of your Bible, do you see a map of everywhere Peter went? No. <laughs> do you see a map of everywhere Paul went? No, oh, it's the missionary journeys of Paul. Paul did so much. So does that mean Paul was more holy than Peter? Does that mean Paul was more saved than Peter? And to the point, does that mean, does that, mean that I myself am less saved than Paul? Because I'll tell you right now, Paul did a lot more than me. <laughs> Paul did a lot more, I think, than all of us. Does that mean we don't share in the same salvation? How could we share in the same salvation then? It's because we're not saved by how much we've done. That's what it comes down to. And it makes us appreciate God's grace. That that's how we're saved. We're not saved based on how much we've done. We're not saved based on how long we've worked. Here in Matthew chapter 20 now, at verse 1, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. He went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. He doesn't even name an amount now. He says, whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and they did, li and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one hired us. The Lord is looking for laborers. He is looking for workers. They say, no one's hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. Whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to the steward, call the laborers, give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, about the 11th hour they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And they, when they received it, they complained against the landowner saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, and have borne the burden and the heat of the day. Yeah. You, you know, I've, I've spoken about this context before. Chapter 19 includes the account of the rich young ruler. You remember what he tells the rich young ruler? Go, sell what you have, and come follow me. He tells, he tells the rich young ruler, come follow me. The same thing he had told those fishermen back at the beginning of his ministry three years prior to this. Come follow me. And Peter followed him, and James followed him, and John followed him, and Levi followed him, and all the apostles had been following him for three years. And he tells this rich young ruler, this Johnny come lately, come follow me. Chapter 21 is him coming into Jerusalem. We're within days of the cross. When he says, come follow me, and you will have the same reward. You know, you have, how do you think the apostles felt about this Johnny come lately? If he would have come, right? I understand he went home sorrowful because he had great possessions. But you just look at the time frame, how long from when the Lord, from when the Lord first called Simon Peter to, he, to him going to the cross, what was that amount of time? Okay. The rich young ruler, from the time he calls him, how long was it to the cross? That amount of time. So if the rich young ruler would have followed him, my point is simply, it's not based on time. Salvation, we are not saved based on how long we have worked, and where you see it is in the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Some people started at the beginning of the day. Some people started at about the third hour. Others started later on the sixth and the ninth hour, and then the eleventh hour. And then he starts calling them, and by the way, you might also think about the context, Jews and Gentiles, okay? 
Jews. We've been following you forever. Gentiles. Well, we're kind of coming along late in the day, aren't we? Right? So these things. So now the owner tells the steward, call the laborers, give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. We've touched on this before. There's a, there's a reason. My daughter works at Culver's. One of the rules they have is you don't find out what other people make. <laughs> you don't find out what other people make because you'll start getting jealous real quick, right? Because, oh, Bobby makes this much and I only make that, you know. Well, that's what's going on here. And the Lord knew what, his, knew what he was doing because it's a test. So he starts with the last and he gives them a denarius. He hadn't even promised them a denarius. He said, I'll give you what's right. And he gives them a denarius. And lo and behold, those folks who started at 8 o'clock that morning, they come and they're like, "Woo! I'm going to get more than a denarius now. Nope, they get a denarius. In what world is that fair? And the reason it's, <laughs> in the world it's not fair. Because the Lord's not talking about a common job. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about grace. We are not saved based on how long we have worked. That's not what we're saved by. So you see how this ties in with we're not saved based on how much we've done. Which one of those labors had done more? The early worker or the later worker? Oh, the early worker, they'd been working all day. They've been working all day. You might think about this, this idea. How long we have worked is inconsequential. Someone becomes a Christian when they're 12 years old. They're faithful their whole life. Someone else becomes a Christian when they're an old man like Nicodemus. And they're faithful their whole life. Who was more faithful? <laughs> Which one's more saved? Right? The young fellow or the young girl who obeys early or the older man or the older woman who obeys late in life? Which one's more saved? Which one has done more? Right? Right? That's not how we're saved. We're not saved by based on how much we've done, and we're not saved based on how long we've worked. That's not what we're saved by. We're saved by God's grace. Now, I will say along with this point, if, again, the Lord is looking for labors, and you can tell, by the way, even within the parable, there's a little bit of a rebuke there when the Lord says, why have you been standing here idle all day? Uh, there's a little bit of a rebuke there. And they say, no one's hired us. If we put off laboring for the Lord, if we put off serving the Lord until it's convenient for us, right? We're missing, we're, something's wrong. And we're missing a point, And we're missing what grace actually is. Do you remember, and what it is, is again, just because someone obeys God does not mean they have earned their salvation. Do you remember when Simon the sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer obeys God, he's baptized. And when he sees the gifts of the Spirit, he offers money. He offers money if perhaps he could purchase that for himself. And as Peter speaks to him, Peter says, this is Acts 8 and verse 22, and I want you to listen for a certain word. And when you hear this word, this is where you find grace. And it's not going to be a, um, it's not going to be a comforting word. It's not going to be a comforting word. But it's there. This is Acts chapter 8 and verse 22. Repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. It's found in that word, perhaps. Does God have to grant forgiveness? He has to grant it. It's by grace. It's by grace. And so my point is, if someone comes along, if someone says, you know what, 
I'm not going to work for the Lord. I don't want to work for the Lord. I got other stuff to do. I got other stuff to do. And then finally one day they're like, okay, it's, it's convenient for me and I'm retired and I don't have a lot of other stuff going on. Okay, now I'll become a Christian. Who in the world says God has to grant that person forgiveness? That's God's end of the stick. Pray God if perhaps, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven. God doesn't have to do it. That's why it's called grace. We don't earn it. We don't earn it. And we can't force it. We can't buy it. We're not saved based on those things. We're saved. We're, we're not saved based on how long we've worked. We're not saved based on how much we've done. We're not. That's not how we're saved. We're saved by grace. And God has to grant it. God has granted unto the Gentiles repentance unto life. God grants it. Right? It's in, it's, that's grace. That's what it is. So all that's to say this. Don't abuse God's grace. That's the problem with shall we continue to sin that grace may abound. We can abuse God's grace and God doesn't have to grant it. It's His favor to give. We've spoken in class recently about how Jesus did not commit Himself to anyone there in Jerusalem because He knew men's hearts. He knew their hearts. So we think about the Lord's granting. But nonetheless, as we look here in Matthew chapter 20 in the parable of the workers in the vineyard, we say, who, who worked more? Who worked for longer? And was their reward any different? No, we're saved by grace. And when we really understand that, it is so liberating that, that it's by God's grace. It's not based on how much we've done or how long we have done it. That's not how we're saved. What about worldly obligations? I want you to come to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Worldly obligations, sometimes, for example, the parable of the sower, as you come to 1 Corinthians 7, you know, the parable of the sower in that third group, the, the thorns as it is, and it speaks about the cares of the world choking the word. And Hebrews speaks about the fact that we need to lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily ensnares us. Not all weights are sinful. Some cares of the world are not inherently sinful, but they may be bogging us down as we walk, as the Lord would have us. But the cares, the cares of the world, worldly obligations, if you will, 1 Corinthians 7 makes a point. It's the chapter that's about marriage. And within the context of marriage, Paul makes, the Holy Spirit makes this comment. And this is 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And let, let's look in verse 32. And there may have been a typo in the bulletin here. I may have said verse 22, but it's verse 32. But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. It's an interesting thing. Those who are unmarried care for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. He who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Now, does that mean that those who are married don't care about the things of the Lord? That's not the point. No, the point is the Lord understands worldly obligations. You're married, you need to give time <laughs> You care about, to quote this passage, you care about the things of the world, how you may please your wife. There's a reason so many husbands have the coffee mug that says, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. All right? Husbands should care about how they may please their wife. Earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it speaks about authority and it's talking about intimacy. And it says in verse 3, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife of her husband. That's talking about the intimate marriage relationship. And the Holy Spirit through Paul is saying, you need to give time to this. All right? As, as it says, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. 
All right, so you need to give time to this. He who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and his wife cares about how she may please her husband. And you dedicate time to this. Doesn't mean you don't care about the Lord, but you care about these things as well. Now, those who are single, those who are unmarried, they are able to single-mindedly care for the things of the Lord. Now, we have a perfect example of this because Paul refers to it when Paul says, oh, he talks about earlier in verse 7, for I wish that all men were even as myself. Well, what was Paul? Paul was single. He's a bachelor. He's a eunuch for the kingdom's sake. That's why when you look at that map in the back of your Bible, it's Paul going all over the place. Peter, while Peter, while the apostles, by the way, are eventually going to, at a certain point, they're in Jerusalem. Peter's not going to die in Jerusalem. Okay? At a certain point, apostles are going to go elsewhere. But are, there, are they going to go as far afield as Paul did? No. And what I would suggest is that in the Lord's providential wisdom, the Lord did not expect them to. We know Peter was married. We know Peter was married. And based on what Paul says about his own, um, his own singleness, right? And when he says, and he actually speaks about, actually it's nearby. Look over in chapter 9. Over in chapter 9 of verse 5, he says, Do we have no right to take along a believing wife as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? You look at that phrase. Verse 6, if you want to see God's grace, look at it in verse 6, at what Paul says. Is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? That phrase, refrain from working, it's speaking about marriage, the marital relationship. And Paul says, do we have no right to refrain from working? Who did more, Paul or Peter? Who did more? Paul was able to serve God single-mindedly. He didn't have a wife. He didn't have children in the flesh. Peter, he's married. Now, Scripture doesn't go into a lot of details. The other apostles, I think you can show from this passage, they're also married. They probably had kids. They probably all had kids in all likelihood. That refraining from working, were there times where Peter may have simply said, I'd like to go home and spend some time with my wife? Is that okay? <laughs> Would it be okay for the apostles to say, I need to go home and spend a Saturday with my wife and children? Is that okay? Is it okay to refrain from working like that? Yes. Why? Because we're saved by grace and we're not saved by works. God understands worldly obligations. He who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Do you really think the Lord as Peter was married. Do you really think the Lord wanted Peter to dedicate himself single-mindedly to the things of the Lord, verse 32 to use that phrase, and neglect his wife at home? You think that's what the Lord wanted him to do? To neglect his wife and possible children at home? No. That's not what the Lord wanted him, to, wanted him to do. Well, now you start getting to it. So I guess caring about the things of the world, how you may please your spouse, familial obligations, so then could that also be called the work of the Lord? Are you doing what the Lord wants you to do then? Yes, I think so. Let's put it another way. We've been looking at Jesus sitting on Jacob's well. Jesus was wearied from his journey, so he sat thus by the well. So he was journeying, and then he was sitting. Which one, in which one of those instances, journeying or sitting, was he doing what God wanted him to do? 
oath in the Old Testament. You work six days, and the seventh is holy. It's a Sabbath. You keep it to the Lord, and you refrain from working. Oh, so, so on those six days, or on that seventh day, which one of those two groups were you doing what the, were you doing what the Lord wanted you to do? Both. <laughs> That's interesting, is it? isn't it? Where you have a refraining from work, and yet you're doing what the Lord wants you to do. And then you're working, and you're doing what the Lord wants you to do. Here, you might think about the same application. But another application, another instance, talking about this, this same sort of thing, worldly obligations. In the congregation here, in the congregation here, we have those who have to care about farming. We have those who have to care about serving customers coming in asking for food. We have those who care about nursing. We have those who care about other things as well. Okay? And those are obligations. <laughs> it's called a job. It's called a job. And then you have me, am I, and I am able to because I do not have a secular job. I am able to, I'm able to study, and I, I don't mean this proudly, but we're just looking at how much time we have in a given day. And when Brad's been working from sunup to beyond sunset, and he comes home and he's exhausted, and here I am, and I've been studying the Bible all day long. Well, he's been out working in the fields all day long, and he comes home, and he does not have as much time to study God's Word as I do, perhaps. Does that make me more holy or more saved than Brad? No. You know why? Because we're saved by grace. We're not saved based on how much we do. I have a file that has every bulletin I've ever done. How many bulletins have you done? <laughs> I've got them going back to whatever it is, 2008, 2009, right? Does that make me more holy because I've done more bulletins than you have? How many times have you spoken to your children or your neighbors? Perhaps I have not. Does that make you more holy? Because you've done some, you've spoken to someone that I have not. No. Where it all, what it all shows and what it all points to is that the Lord understands worldly obligations. I think the Apostle Paul is an interesting example of this. Because at a certain point, Paul did make tents. So he started having a secular job. Now, did that secular job pull him away from his work as an apostle? I think you would say it had to on some level. He had to dedicate time to making tents with Priscilla and Aquila. He had to dedicate time to do that. He makes a point of not taking support, by the way, from the church in Corinth, and he's making tents. He's having to dedicate time to that, to that venture, if you will. Did that somehow mean he was less holy? No. Did that, that somehow mean he was less saved? No. Did the Lord understand that worldly obligation? Right? Did he understand that? Yes. Yes. Do you understand how looking at that, how that makes us appreciate God's grace? Because we're not saved by how much we do, right? We may have to go work at the hospital. We may have to go work at the farm. We may have to go work at the restaurant. We may have those worldly concerns. We may have those worldly obligations, and the Lord understands that. The Lord understands that. We're saved by grace. We're not saved based on how much we do. There are now, there are things, again, there are things we must do. Okay? And sometimes people have a problem with calling this a checklist, and perhaps, perhaps we shouldn't, but there are things we must do. 
we must hear and believe. We must hear and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The reason we must hear and believe is because without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Okay? We must have faith. We must. So it's something we must do. God does not have faith for us. God has revealed His Word, and we read and we hear and we believe. That's what we must do. We must confess with the mouth. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. When Jesus says, unless a man... Right? He talks about those who confess. He who confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father. We must confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We must repent. Jesus said, unless ye repent, you will all likewise perish. We must. We must do that. We must be baptized. Go ahead and be turning over to Ephesians. Last week, that passage we read, when it speaks, speaks about the unity of the faith, Unity of the Spirit, pardon me, unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And there's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We must be baptized. It's something we must do. We must call upon the name of the Lord in baptism. We must do it. And then we rise to walk in newness of life. Okay? What, the, what that walk does as we walk in newness of life, that moves us beyond a checklist and it moves us into every day. It moves us into everyday life. And I'll, I'll say this as we start to wrap things up. I think we make being a Christian sometimes a little too complicated. Right? We use terminology and in our mind we think, I've got to keep all the commandments. I've got to keep all the commandments. And we're visualizing some list, like all of those things in the Old Testament. Right? And we're, we're visualizing, I gotta, I gotta keep all the commandments. Well, what do you mean by that? I must hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. I must do those things. Okay, and then I must walk faithfully. Now, what does that mean? This is Ephesians chapter 5 at verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light of the light of, in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Now, how simple is that? See what I mean when I say sometimes I feel like we make being a Christian too complicated. We think, i got to keep all the commandments. Well, what are the commandments? See, that's the thing. When they came to Jesus, tell me the commandment. Tell me the commandment. Give me a list of things I got to do. And the Lord says, love the Lord and love your neighbor. On these things hangs everything else. Now, how simple is that answer? That is so simple. And it moves us beyond a checklist mentality into a lifestyle. It's like, oh, I'm supposed to be engaged and bearing goodness, righteousness, and truth. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Galatians also speaks more about the fruit of the Spirit, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And it's that phrase. If you don't see God's grace in that, I would encourage you to look again. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. To just consider it. The grace of God. We may be old, we may be young or old. We may be rich or poor. We may be male or female. We may be strong or weak. We may be married or single. Each one of those things points to either different abilities or different opportunities. Okay? Young or old. We're still saved by grace. Rich or poor. Paul tells Timothy, command those who are rich to be rich in good works. Well, what about those who don't have, what about those who are not rich? What, what about the, the widow and her two mites? She wasn't rich. Male or female, that speaks to roles. That speaks to roles. So because men 
have been charged with one work and women have been charged with another work, that would be like coming to me. That would be like me coming to Jennifer and saying, you know what, you're a horrible father. That's because she's not a father. <laughs> it would be like her coming to me saying, you know what, you're a horrible mother. We have different roles, different God-given roles within the church. We've spoken recently about those roles. Is one role more important than another role? No. <laughs> We're not saved based on what we, what we do, how much we do, male or female, strong or weak. That gets into the realm of liberties. One man believe he, believes he can eat all things. Another man believes he can only eat vegetables. And it says God has accepted him. God has accepted him. Paul says, if eating meat offends my brother, even though I know all things are lawful, all things are not helpful, so if eating meat offends my brother, I'm not going to do it so we can have unity. God has accepted him. The one who eats and the one who does not eat. That's the realm of liberty, strong or weak. That's why the Christians were told, receive one who is weak in the faith, not to disputes over doubtful things, but receive him. There are those who are immature in the faith, and there are those who are mature in the faith. Which one's more saved? We're not saved based on that. We're saved by grace. We may be weak, we may be strong, married or single. What we do is we do what we can. We do what we can, growing in grace and knowledge. And we're saved by grace. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. We're saved by grace. That's what we're saved by. Now, if your takeaway from this whole lesson, if your takeaway is, that means I can do less and still be pleasing to the Lord. You don't understand God's grace. If your takeaway from this lesson is, I cannot do enough to be pleasing to the Lord, that's why I'm saved by grace. <laughs> we can't earn it. And actually, when we do what the Lord calls us to do, wherever we are, on that path, when we come from the waters of baptism and we are born again, And there's just so many different ways we could, there's so many different ways you can skin a cat. I'll give you two. And they both speak to the same thing. The Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee prayed thus with himself, I thank thee that I'm not like other men. I fast twice a week. I give tithes on all that I possess. It was all about what he did. Right? I do this, I do that. The tax collector went home justified, what had he done? He smote his breast and he would not even lift up his eyes. He smote his breast and he said, God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. He repented. So if you want to say that's what he did, okay, he, he did that. He repented. But as far as beyond that, Beyond that, what did he do? He goes home justified. He repented. When Naaman dipped in the Jordan, in that seventh time, he came up from the waters and he's cleansed. What had he done? Well, he had dipped. He had gone down into the waters. Beyond that, what had he done, though? Beyond that, he had submitted to what the Lord wanted him to do. That's what he did. He submitted. And his leprosy, his disease, was cleansed by God's grace, by God's favor. And when we submit to the Lord in baptism, and our sins are washed away, and we rise to walk in newness of life, and by the way, that rising... The Lord is also instrumental in that. Just as God raised Jesus from the dead, He raises us. So again, that's God's work. As God's power works within us. So what have we done then? <laughs> we have submitted. We have submitted. And in doing that, in submitting, 
in doing what we can, it is an amazing thing. It is an amazing thing. We know what the Lord says. When you have done, if you, when you have done everything you have been commanded to do. When you have done everything you've been commanded to do, you are to say we are still unprofitable servants. Pardon me while I see if I can find that verse. This is Luke chapter 17. Come to Luke 17, please, as we offer the invitation. I appreciate your patience. Um, I hope this lesson's been helpful to understand God's grace. Luke 17 at verse 6. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. And which of you, and here's the point, which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat, but he will not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you've done all those things which you are commanded, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. That is from our perspective. Right? When we, when we come in at the end of the day, we do not get to say... We do not get to say, serve me. We do not get to say that. What we get to say is we are unprofitable servants. Now in the context, verse 9, does he, the master, does the master thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? Does the master say that? Not the Lord in the, in the text. No. Now here's God's grace that the Lord would say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That when we have done what we can and we're not saved by grace, it is amazing, it is an amazing thing that the Lord says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That is an amazing thing. If you're here this morning, if you're not a Christian, turn to the Lord and be saved by God's grace. Be baptized, putting on Christ. Please, if you are a Christian but you've been unfaithful, understand, we're called to faithfulness. We are called to have a walk worthy of our calling. And if we are not walking worthy of our calling, then we are despising God's grace. Don't do that. Don't do that. Respond as we have an opportunity. Please come while we stand and sing today.